our next speaker, um, I'm partial to because I was once a young law professor, and he is a young law professor, Professor Andrew Ferguson at the uh, UDC School of Law. Um, he is, I was immediately drawn to the fact that he has been uh, voted uh, Professor of the Year three times at his law school, which uh, to me says not only must he be a great professor, but he's not tough enough on the students. He's got to get, got to get tougher on the students. In fact, I, I see some students here. They should be in the library studying. What are you guys doing here? So, Professor Ferguson is an expert in um, the civil jury system, having written a, a, a book called Why Jury Duty Matters, A Citizen's Guide to Constitutional Action, and it's the first book written for jurors on jur jury duty. So please welcome enthusiastically Professor Ferguson. Thank you very much. It is an honor to be among fellow advocates in the cause for civil justice. This talk is supposed to be about the history of the civil jury. So I want to bring you all the way back to last month, when a civil jury in the District of Columbia found a pregnant woman's rights were violated when she was fired from Chipotle for being pregnant. Citizens saw an injustice and acted upon it as a jury. One woman challenged a multi-billion dollar company, and because of ordinary citizens, she won. Or we can go even farther back to last year, when a civil jury awarded $3.4 million to Seneca and Tari Adams for enduring vicious beatings by the Chicago police and for prolonged detentions in Cook County Jail. Two men who took on the government, took on the law, took on the police in front of a jury, in front of their citizen, and won because of citizen involvement. My point is that the history of the jury is now. Today in courthouses across America, citizens are listening to a plaintiff's lawyer explain how a law was broken. These citizens likely did not know about this law before trial. They did not know the people involved. They did not foresee their role or their power. But right now, this very second, they're living a constitutional principle in the Seventh Amendment and upholding the principles of the Constitution that we, the people, control the law. They are part of the civil jury's history, maybe a small part, but one that can trace its lineage back to the first boats that came over to Jamestown. Right in the charter that founded the Jamestown colony, there was the protection of the right to trial by jury. And this history is not the stuff of dusty books. It is foundational. It is current. That history has continued from Jamestown to every courthouse that has ever been built in America. Think about that. Every single courthouse in America shares the tradition of the civil jury. In each of the 13 colonies, in each state, in each city, in each town. And this history is not just a relic, but a monument built into the architecture of justice. A jury box sitting there built symbolizes citizen action. It, it symbolizes juror power. In each of those courtrooms from the colonies to the states to the cities and towns, there were citizens living our history, being a part of that history. These citizens are living a right, a constitutional right, a right that women, African Americans, Latinos, the poor, and everyone else has fought to share. And that history is alive in each courthouse and in each jury panel. And why? Because juries exist as a pure form of citizen power. Twelve strangers in a room deciding the most difficult questions of the day. All those easy cases they settle out. Twelve strangers using reason, deliberation, and community values to pass judgment. As a community, a community body, local, democratic, equal. A body designed to level the power structures outside the courthouse and inside that deliberation room. A body designed to symbolize citizen engagement in the implementations of our laws. Juries legitimize, they challenge, they protect the rule of law every single business day. That is our history played out in millions of jury rooms across America. But as you all know, history is not always so uplifting. Many of our most significant moments are tragic and dark. Wars, assassinations, riots, famines, the list goes on. 
So any real history lesson must capture both the good and the bad. And if you were to look down now above on the history of the civil jury today, you would not find or see an uplifting moment. If you trace through its actual use, you would see a rapid, almost deadly decline. If you trace through the historical commentary about its use, you would find little positive. This historical moment today is a dark one for the civil jury. Less than 1% of civil cases are heard before a civil jury. That's an important fact, and one that will be repeated over and over again today, but really must be repeated to see the crisis state of where we are. Less than 1% of cases are now heard by citizens in a civil jury. That means that fewer Americans are given constitutional power to decide how the law should be applied than ever before. And who benefits from this state of affairs? Who benefits from citizens being stripped of constitutional power to decide how the law should be applied? Not citizens. In a conference entitled Breaking Through Power, I want to focus this modern history lesson on power, citizen power, and how we can use a civil jury and jury duty to reclaim that power. I have only one goal here today, to show you that the history of the civil jury is a constitutional history, and that our collective apathy at the decline of the civil jury has reduced citizens' constitutional power. When governments and corporate interests attack the First Amendment rights using restrictive legislation and rulemaking, people spoke up. They protested. They stopped it. When they came for the Second Amendment rights, for good or bad, citizens fought back. But when they came for our Seventh Amendment rights, heard next to nothing. A fundamental constitutional source of citizen power has been taken from we the people with barely a shrug. As a scholar, I see a national failure to link the jury to the Constitution. And that's where it comes from, the Constitution. You may think that that jury summons you receive in the mail comes from the court, but the court just provides the postage. It comes from the Constitution. And your role as juror is not to serve the court, but to serve the Constitution, and occasionally challenge that very court. We have forgotten that being a juror has always been part of our constitutional identity. And I don't mean just sitting on a jury. I mean like you are a voter today, now, even though you're not sitting in a voting booth. You're a juror now, even though you're not currently in court. From our founding on, our American political identity has turned on two rights and responsibilities. Two, voting and serving on a jury. It's what defined political power at the founding. It is the political power the founders were fighting to control. It became the goal of the suffragettes and the civil rights movement, and it's what we're fighting for now. It is a constitutional identity we have lost. And think about it. Just think about it in your own lives. Well, I handed out a piece of paper now, and I said, I want you to self-identify who you are. Father, mother, brother, wife, husband, Democrat, Republican, no, that's probably not even a Republican, independent, Green Party, race, gender, religion, job. Where does being a juror fit in, in your list of identity? You wouldn't even, it wouldn't even make the cut. It wouldn't, make, it wouldn't show up there. You wouldn't think of yourself right now sitting in this room as a juror. Yet that reality, which is the reality, is ahistorical. It runs against the central understanding of citizenship from the founding to the suffrage movement to the civil rights movement, and I argue has undermined the centrality of the jury in our civil justice system today. My argument here is that we once did conceive our political identity as consisting of two equally important pillars, a right to vote and a right to serve as jurors. And history teaches us we must get that identity back. It was that political identity that was adopted by all those who fought for equality to get the 19th Amendment. Women suffragettes realized that simply getting the right to vote would not be enough without the right to serve on a jury. The National League of Women uh, Voters used jury duty on the top of their Bill of Rights, recognizing unless they could sit down in that room as equals, they would never be considered political or constitutional equals. As part of the Civil Rights Movement led by Charles Hamilton Houston, he began with jury service and jury inclusion, well before you get to Brown v. Board of Education, you have a series of jury cases before the Supreme Court. Why? Because sitting on a jury meant equality, political equality and power. It was a recognition that by being a citizen, you were a juror, and thus you had an investment in this judicial system, this democratic system, this constitutional system. And civil juries have leveled the playing field, from exploding cars to toxic torts to individual wrongs. The jury, and perhaps just as importantly, the threat of a public, civic, democratic accountability moment has been the force of keeping power with the people. This identity is part of you today, right now, 
And I argue that if you think of yourself right now as a potential juror outside of jury service, you'll be more engaged in this fight to preserve the civil jury. Because other, otherwise, honestly, why do you care if one of your civic tasks is simply reduced, becomes less burdensome? So how do we lose this constitutional identity? In my scholarship, I contrast this idea of a constitutional juror with that of a task-oriented juror. You think about it. Citizens today think that, they, that jury duty is something they serve at a particular place, a particular time. It's pretty limited, and it's not much more. They don't do anything to prepare for. They don't really think about it before or afterwards. And the reason for this is because of three uh, changes that I won't go into now, but it focuses on the limited role the Supreme Court has recasted for the jury. Jurors are asked to do less. It involves jury instructions. Jurors are told to do less. And it also involves some of the procedural changes of streamlining juries, things like one day, one trial, which is a great innovation, innovation for efficiency, changes the identity. You are asked to do a particular task at a particular time, and you wait your two years, and then you show up again. That is not about identity or a constitutional identity, and that has consequences. The consequence of this task-oriented focus weakens the jury. But perhaps most importantly for this room, it weakens citizen power. If juries are merely task-like functionaries, it becomes much easier to ignore their importance and not even think about why they matter. Jurors are no longer thought of as a structural power source, but just a job to be completed. And like most tasks, most jobs, reducing that's probably a good thing. But if conceived as an identity, a political sense of self, this reduction is a threat to you personally. And this argument says as much about power as it is about identity. We need to make real a very simple truth. They are taking away your rights, your power. When decisions are made by some other legal institution, some other legal power source, citizens lose. And we need people to see that reality and to be outraged when someone's trying to take away their power. If you framed this larger debate as follows, you might get a very different outcome. Large corporations, lawyers, and the government are conspiring to systematically strip you of your constitutional rights. So you have less voice and less power. But we don't actually frame it that way. We frame jury duty as a burden, not a power. We frame jury service as something we do for the courts, not ourselves, when it is actually a very personal protection. In fact, the history of the jury has been just as protective as the Second Amendment in safeguarding us against so-called tyranny, yet the passion and constitutional connection for the Seventh Amendment pales in comparison. Where's the bumper sticker saying, I will give up the jury when you pry the summons out of my cold, dead hands? It doesn't exist. This is nothing short of a battle over political and constitutional power. And the citizens are losing that battle. Worse, we don't seem to care. Ask yourself, honestly, last time you or an employee or a family member got that summons in the mail, whether you registered a positive, constitutionally inspired feeling, or a dull groan. We have work to do to make citizens see that the jury matters, that it can be meaningful. We have work to make citizens see jury service as constitution service. The civil jury still matters because it gives citizens the opportunity, and a rare one in this lifetime, to prove that citizens still matter in a democracy. Citizens deciding cases for fellow citizens, ordinary people retaining the power granted to the people. To shake up our apathy, we need to educate. Some of you are activists, some educators, some lawyers, and almost all of you are citizens. So you know that millions of Americans are touched by the jury process each year. And you also must know that jurors are largely ignorant about the role of the jury in America. Jury duty, jury service can be a moment to arrest that civic ignorance. To me, jury duty is this missed teaching moment for civic education about the jury. I find it odd with an, essentially a captured audience of potentially interested citizens. We as a society don't do everything we can to educate them about the jury and the Constitution. We don't teach about the role or history of the jury. We don't connect it to the Constitution. And I find it even odder that educated citizens don't seem to care enough to educate themselves before they serve. To me, it almost borders on the irresponsible to show up to jury service without actually thought about why you're there. So the first time you're thinking about negligence and beyond a reasonable doubt is in the jury room? There are people's lives and liberties at stake. And this is the first time you bothered to figure out what this jury thing was all about? As a society, as a population, we do so little to prepare citizens for the role they must serve. And then we wonder why it wasn't meaningful for them. 
If you could take the million or so sitting jurors and the 10 to 20 million potential jurors every single year and turn them into your civic ambassadors for power and engagement by teaching them about the importance of the jury while in jury service, you would be improving things. And this change in attitude will not simply benefit democracy, but the actual jury service itself. Jury education built into the jury process will be an educative moment. It will build constitutional literacy. It will strengthen the juror's reputation. It will improve democratic practice. It will enrich deliberation. And these are all weaknesses regularly attributed to the jury process itself. This truth has been long recognized. You can see it in the writings of the anti-federalists, Tocqueville, and the modern Supreme Court cases. The jury as a public school is a theme that runs throughout our country. But we're doing a bad job teaching. We need to create citizen education products and forums to teach this constitutional truth. But here's the rub. If I proposed a pre-jury service seminar for the public, how many people think would really attend? I already wrote a book about it, but I know how few people read it. So what can this collective group of educators and advocates do? I offer three concrete uh, suggestions to counter the apathy of juror engagement. First, start with yourself. Learn about the history of the civil jury and its connection to the Constitution. And if you don't know, you cannot educate and you shouldn't complain. Second, find a jury of family and friends. If every person hearing me right now could reach 12 people and educate them about this power and this role, a beginning of a grassroots education campaign could start. And third, seize the decline of the civil jury as a political issue. The NRA has done a fabulous job getting ordinary Americans to care about the Second Amendment. We need to focus on the Seventh Amendment. Moneyed interests in the government are actively trying to reduce constitutional power. Juries as local, small-D democratic institutions meant to check governmental power, corporate power, are politically appealing institutions in this day and age. This is a cause to fight for and one that potentially might have bipartisan support. My final point. We have the history about why the jury is important on our side. We have the Constitution and all of the structural arguments on our side. Yet we hear over and over again concerns about efficiency and cost. But efficiency is not in the Constitution. Trial by jury is. The high cost of litigation is not in the Constitution. Trial by jury is. Arbitration is not in the Constitution. Trial by jury is. We have the weight of constitutional law and history on our side, and we should use it to strengthen our argument. Jury duty is Constitution duty. And the jury is a structural Constitution reservation of power to the citizen. Let's not lose it. Let's be able to answer the question of why jury duty matters, and let's pray that the history of the civil jury continues, and that we, the people, can continue to tell its story. Thank you, and thank you for being here.